it's great to be here. Um, I'm glad that I held on for the delayed uh, conference. Um, a bit like Chris, but not so many years. Um, when I wrote the paper on Scotland's medieval salt industry, it was published in 2011, 2012. The research was completed in uh, 2009. And I thought, that's it, I'm finished, I'm done. Um, and it, it, it itself had actually been a byproduct um, of looking at what is my main interest in the uh, medieval environmental history, which is uh, fuel consumption, fuel transitions, fuel shortages. And one of the places where we keep getting the information about these recurrent crises is in salt production. And it's one of the motors that drives uh, technical change in the, the nature of salt making in Scotland um, at two stages in the, the medieval period. And of course, you know, the, the, the obvious thing that always happens, I'm, I'm sure Chris experienced this himself, is as soon as you think you've said the final word on a particular thing, you go and look at uh, something completely unrelated and they're staring at you, something that directly contradicts a claim you made. So I'd said, you know, I can't find much evidence apart from a couple of place names for salt making in the Lake of Murray, for example. And then bang, I'm looking at the Murray Registrum and here, because it's not indexed as, you know, there's no reference to salt in the index, but there's uh, a whole series which I'll be talking about um, in the course of um, this presentation. Um, just uh, to say at the start, most of the images are my own, which is why they're so bad. There's a couple from Scran and Canmore, um, and there's one wonderful one for Kirkenzi, which uh, we might be hearing a little bit more about um, later on uh, today. So, Chris um, alluded to the fact that your know, salt has been an essential um, from time immemorial. And one of the, the biggest problems that we have is identifying when, as an industry, it starts uh, to develop in Scotland. And a big part of this problem is just quite simply, you know, the, the, the historian's problem. And this is where I, I, I like to oscillate back and forth between, you know, what am I? Um, I was trained as an archaeologist as well as a historian, and I like to always try to be interdisciplinary. So you need to augment the historical record with the archaeological, and you need to augment the archaeological record with the historical. Neither should be privileged one over the other. They've both got things to contribute. But you also need to bring in uh, as many different pieces of evidence as you can possibly do. Archaeology can't tell us all the answers, neither can the documentary record. Um, but we can look at other sources of evidence too, um, and those include climate records. Um, and those are things that will be of very great importance to us um, as we move through um, this talk. But one of the things in terms of climate record is when we begin to see evidence for salt production on a large scale coincides with the beginning of the long period of what's known as the medieval climate anomaly, um, running from the middle of the 11th century through um, to the middle of the 13th century. Um, stabler, generally drier, uh, better conditions, but also rising population. So rising demand for commodities that are absolutely essential. As Chris said, salt is the only bulk preservative available until the modern era. Everybody who is involved in dairying, meat processing, fish processing, but also things like the hardening of canvas, um, the curing of leather, needed salt. And if you're not happy, uh, or rather lucky to be living someplace like Droitwich, where you've got the, the salt wells, you're having to produce salt, obtain it from somewhere. If you live in the central highlands, you still need salt. So there has to be a trade in this from very early on. But the earliest, I can now push back, Chris, beyond the 12th century, the earliest I've now found is this reference of a grant um, of a salinagium to the, the Kelledy monks uh, of Loch Leven. We don't exactly know uh, where Conan is. I've asked Simon Taylor, um, and he hasn't given me a definitive answer on it. Um, it's possibly down in the vicinity um, of Inverkeething, where um, the monks also have 
um, property. But they're given it by um, Malcolm, son of Duncan. That's Malcolm III. Um, the fact that it's Malcolm on his own, not with his wife, St. Margaret, uh, and normally from the time of their marriage, they are paired in documents, suggests it's pre the marriage to, to Margaret. So sometime before 1070, between 1057 and 1070. So we've got salt production. And what is clear, and, and this is you know, the, the thing to take from this is, by 1057, a salt industry is already in operation. And the crown has got pans of its own to give to other people. So you've got an industry um, that is there um, developed. And so salt on the south coast of Fife is already um, a, an active um, industry. We then see through the 12th century, the records that I was originally talking about back in uh, the 2011 paper, so salt's been delivered for the king's use uh, at Dunfermline in about 1128. And these, are, it's possible, um, very highly likely actually, that this is coming from the, the royal pans in Verkeething. Um, and if th those of you who know about the great events uh, of 1286, March 1286, when you're drunk in charge of a horse, Alexander III wants to get back to his new wife in Kinghorn, and the master of the royal salt pans at Inverkeething tries to persuade him to stay the night in Inverkeething. He goes galloping off into the darkness and breaks his neck, precipitating one of the major crises uh, in, in Scottish uh, history. So there's a major concentration of pans, royal-owned pans, in that area through the 12th and 13th centuries. But the biggest concentration is right up at the head of the fourth estuary in the castlands um, around Stirling, extending from Stirling down uh, to the Kincardine area on the north side uh, and down to the Cars of Callander, uh, Grangemouth area on the, the south. And we start to see increasingly through the reign of David I, king from 1124 to 53, grants by the king to uh, various monastic houses uh, of Pan. So he desires in 1139 that the abbot of Dunfermline have a salt pan beside his pans, plural. The king has got multiple pans in this uh, part of the world. Between 1140 and 53, he's also giving pans to New Mathel Abbey in the Cars of Calendar, um, and these are now underneath uh, Grangemouth Oil Refinery. Um, Holyrood Abbey at Airth, Kelso Abbey just in the Cars, somewhere in that uh, general area. Cambus Kenneth Abbey in the Cars of Stirling specifically, and Jedburgh Abbey beside Stirling. Now, there's a danger in that we are seeing a lot of these grants going to monastic houses. That is because of the accident of survival of record. And simply because we see a large number of monasteries, it does not mean A, that the monasteries are the developers of the salt industry, or B, that they are the majority owners of the salt pans. It's just simply that the record survives for them better than for others. And in nine out of 10 of the cases that I've identified, they are taking on the management ownership of pre-existing pans. So they're taking over something rather than creating it uh, de novo. So they're mainly um, stretching from the, the karstland um, right up here at Stirling itself, looking out over the now peat-stripped karst. Um, so, oh, well, uh, Graham's dairies want to build houses on this now. Um, but you know, from there, right downstream, you seem to have multiple salt pans uh, being developed through uh, the 12th century. This is the cars down at Earth, a thoroughly attractive uh, location, especially if you see it at low tide, it smells to high heaven. Um, it, it, it's not one of the most desirable pieces of real estate nowadays, but then this was what you wanted because what Chris has been talking about is primarily direct seawater evaporation. The pans, because they're up there in the upper reaches of the Forth, they are not direct boiling, it is sleaching. Um, and this is where the salt is flushed out of the, the estuarine muds. Um, you repeatedly 
uh, rinse the, uh, the mud until you end up with a thick saline solution. And that is what you then uh, boil. So the pans are located down in these muddy areas. Now, sadly, uh, there are a number of sleaching sites that have been identified uh, in England. No sleaching site has been securely identified of this date in Scotland. Um, but what you would have is a salt cot uh, within which the, the boiling uh, takes place. There is a small community there because the grants include um, pasture uh, for the, the beasts that are needed both to carry the fuel in but also to carry the product away. There may be a small patch of arable to sustain the families um, who are working at these locations. You've also got the fuel store, and the fuel store will become increasingly important um, because, well, switches in fuel types uh, as to what is going to be available and how it can be best used. In general, pre-15th century pans that we can identify are in locations where sleaching would be more likely than direct seawater boiling. And there are some places where they don't occur. Uh, for example, one of the areas, you know, you've got the Carses in the, the Firth of Forth. One of the biggest Carse areas in Scotland is the Carse of Gowrie. There is no sleaching going on there. And the reason for that is the Tay has got the highest freshwater discharge of any river in Scotland. Therefore, it ain't worth your while even trying to boil the water because you'd end up using a hell of a lot of fuel to create a tiny amount of salt. But right round the coast, any place where you can get ideal conditions, so Montrose Basin, um, for example, um, here, uh, up here, classed as Altons, is actually Nig Bay. Uh, so it's on the sands uh, at Nig Bay, just south um, of Aberdeen. But you see the majority of the pans in here, in the inner reaches um, of the Forth. Um, this is on the sands at Broxmouth. You've got a very important concentration, uh, Rain Patrick, uh, round about Kerlaverick, down uh, round uh, Southern S, uh, into the, um, the mouth um, of the Ur and round into the D down in, in the southwest. Very important group um, just here, uh, stretching from Turnbury uh, up to Greenan. And then in the Firth of uh, Clyde, um, you've got Paisley Abbey with uh, salt pans, for example, at Roseneath again on the, the estuarine silts um, there. But you know, most of the major monasteries are players in this. Um, some of them only have one pan, but it may be all they needed. But the really major houses that are heavily into either fishing or animal processing have got multiple pans. And for example, you know, Melrose um, with its pan uh, over here at Greenan is actually transporting product from there to there as well as from its pan here in Broxmouth down uh, to Melrose and similarly up to the house from the ones down here as well as using it for their salmon fisheries and for their cattle ranches in Ayrshire um, and, and round the head of the Solway. So just a couple um, of the sites uh, this is the inner part of Montrose Basin, the, um, the estuary of the South Esk, and it's looking over towards Dunn uh, here, an area that would really reward um, looking at. We've got references uh, in the reign Malcolm IV, we can add as well, uh, between David I and William. Malcolm IV um, gives uh, a teen of the salt produced in Montrose, which is just off the picture here, from the royal pans there. Um, at the, the turn of the 12th and 13th century, the Hastings family at Dunn um, is granting a salt pan alongside his own pans to uh, the monks uh, of Arbroath Abbey, Juxtas Salinas Meas. Uh, and then another one that tends to get forgotten about is the sleaching site as opposed to the later direct sea boiling site at Balgove uh, on the, the Eden estuary. Um, in existence uh, from the, the 12th century. So the canons of St Andrews um, have got their, their own pan uh, as well uh, at the mouth there. Now moving north, if you think about ideal locations for sleeching, this is one of the things that puzzled me so much when I was originally looking at it. The Lake of Murray, 
which originally, of course, um, until the, the Lindsays of Fendrasse, the Dunbars of Westfield, etc., drain it in the late 18th and 19th centuries, was one of the biggest brackish lagoons um, around the Scottish coast. And the upslopes on either side of it, either on the north side onto the Berg Sea Ridge or the south side uh, up uh, Quarrelwood uh, and over to, to Elgin itself, um, these were the locations of pans. All that's left of Spiny Loch is this overgrown pond, um, fantastic place for wildfowl, um, but this thing here, the Great Cut, as it's called, um, is what drained, finally drained um, the, um, the lake um, in the um, early 19th century. Now, don't look for them because they're not actually on Pont's map. I just put it on to show you. Here is the Loch of Spiney in its fuller extent, extending down past Duffus Castle. And the place, Salter Hill, is actually here between Ballormey and the castle, right on the, the shoreline uh, of the now uh, drained loch. Um, originally, there were exits at the, east, at the, the west and the east. Uh, this is Lossy Mouth um, up here now. Um, and at the other end, at Rose Isle, um, there was an outlet down just near where, where Berg Head um, is projecting into the sea. The place name, as I say, um, Salter Hill, was one of my first clues on the map um, lying here. But we also started, um, I was looking through the, the record when I was working on Elgin Cathedral um, and began to get 13th to 16th century references to salt cots. Um, and plural salt cots, not just one or two. And the first ones I was finding were along the, the south side um, of uh, Spiny Loch here, and then later further ones uh, between the mouth of the Lossy and the mouth of the Spey, again where there had been brackish ponds um, and, and estuarine silting up um, to, uh, to basically provide commodity. So here's Duffus Castle, um, which seems to have been uh, at the heart of a complex of salt production. Um, the De Moravias, the Murray family uh, who have this, um, are very, very much um, tied up in the, um, the sheep trade, uh, but they're also heavily into fish uh, production uh, through the medieval period. The area here that you can see is just, you know, it, it, it's part of the drained loch bed. Um, so the castle, when it's first established in the second quarter of the 12th century, uh, originally stood, probably stood, in the marsh um, rather than on the, the dry land. Uh, looking south here, this is the, well, that's Quarrelwood itself up here, um, but the sleaching sites were somewhere on this upslope beyond the castle on the south side um, of the um, the lake proper. And the references uh, we have, uh, the earliest one I've identified so far is 1226, um, where you've got Bishop Andrew of Murray coming to an agreement, um, and it's about a deal that of old. So this goes back to the 12th century, um, and they had claims to, to rights to use the wood and the moor of Spiny. Now, most people who've looked at it have concentrated on the fact that th there's common pasture rights here, but there is also rights to peat and to timber uh, involved. And this um, carries um, on down, and ultimately, um, there is a concession a return for an annual rent of half a stone of beeswax, um, candles, you know, again, emphasis, another environmental history um, thing, greater numbers of bees around and being exploited for their wax um, in the medieval period. But what you've got is the grazing and the fuel resources are being requested for access by the, the salter tenants of the de Moravias. So the, the, the bishop has got a competing right to this, um, the, um, the Murrays are also wanting to have access uh, to this property. So we're beginning to pick up, so it's as far as the salt cot, which is between Fendrassi and Kintre, there's a location for a medieval pan for you start looking. Um, so and it, it's not a huge area, it's only about half a mile uh, between the two. So in May 1238, this is another one um, 
uh, as I say, the more you look, the more you find. Uh, and this is an agreement between the treasurer of the See of Murray and the monks of Urquhart Priory, uh, which is the long between uh, Fockabers and, and Elgin, um, over the, the teens of the Church of Esso, and they include a second salt cot, uh, and this appears to be uh, up on the coast near Bin. Um, so again, if you're wanting to look for pans, uh, early pan sites, um, there, again, another area where uh, you've got storm beaches that have created these um, uh, brackish lagoons uh, inland behind, and those are where I think the exploitation uh, is taking place. And you've got, you know, so much evidence of what's going on uh, in this area right through um, the medieval into the early modern period. Now, all, all of the things here are way, way post-medieval. Uh, they're just there as illustrations of the enormous salmon trade that was run out of the Spey, out of the Findhorn, and of course the, the rivers uh, around the head of the, the Murray Firth uh, generally. And the bishops of Murray are amongst the biggest exporters of salmon in Scotland in the medieval period. If you look at the, the Murray uh, rental records, uh, salmon features uh, massively. Uh, my late colleague Alistair Ross did a lot of research on this um, and you know it, it's, 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 it's boggling the volume that is being produced um, and it needed salting. So there is uh, one of your principal um, demands being placed on the, the salt uh, locally. Now, this is where I originally came into it. Fuel is essential. You know, yes, you can make salt by solar evaporation, but even during the peak of the medieval climate anomaly, you know, as, as we know only too well in Scotland, solar evaporation is not really a reliable method, uh, method uh, of, of salt production. Maybe a few days this year you could have done it, and they didn't have the benefit of polytunnels and things like that. So you're having to uh, find a fuel source. And almost all of the earlier 12th century grants, down to about 1175, what is being given is wood. Access to the woods of Clickman and access uh, to the king's wood, access to sources of brush. And we see that as well um, in the 1220s grants in, in Murray, where again it's access Yes, to the bishop's moor, so maybe peat as well, uh, but certainly to the bishop's woods. Um, and it's building timber as well, but it is fuel wood uh, that has been taken uh, primarily. By the time we get to around about 1200 and just after, wood disappears. And we can say this generally, in most of the areas where there is intensive population, um, there is already a wood shortage. A uh, voracious felling of timber. It's a timber-built landscape, a uh, townscape that you're looking at. So wood is in short supply. Massive woodlands in the in in interior, but that's too far away for, for easy exploitation by people who need fuel wood in bulk. And it's peat that you start to see. And increasingly, um, the, the monasteries are going back to the crown and saying, can we have peat? When there's a confirmation, can we have peat? So there is a, a shift takes place um, between the, the 12th and into the 13th century. And you know, we, we see this writ large throughout the records. You know, here um, when Malcolm IV expands on the, 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 his grandfather David I's confirmation of the, uh, the pan given to the monks at New Battle. So it's common easement in pasture, water and fuel for the salt pan in the wood of calendar. So this is in the uh, late 1150s, early um, 1160s. Um, and the, um, the similar grant to uh, Cambus Kenneth, as much land as one of my own salt pans, including access to common resources such as pasture and fuel wood. So you've got a, a, a regular giving uh, of the, the normal supply being wood. What you then see is situations such as this in Melrose's pan at Greenan, where the grant somewhere on the sands below Greenan Castle at Doonfoot, uh, you've got a gifted pan in about 1180 alongside um, Roger's own salt pans there, and he gives them the right to take as much timber as they wish 
from his demean woods of Greenan. As much timber as they wish, because these woods are inexhaustible. Less than 20 years later, the Abbey goes, we've used up and consumed the term that is in the charter, all of the woods of Greenan. And so they ask Duncha, uh, the Lord of Carrick, um, if he can come to their help. They need to have salt pans over there because they've got the salmon fishery. They've also got their great cattle ranch at Mochlin um, that they need to, to be processing the meat and the dairy and the hides. They get two new pans with unlimited access to peat moss, but no new woodland. Even the seemingly exhaustible supply of peat is coming under um, great pressure um, before the end of the 13th century, particularly in areas of high demand um, around about the head of the Solway, but also um, in um, the, the Fourth Carses. And we can maybe see hints of that in the conflict between the Bishop of Murray and the Murray family, um, that there's, there's, there's um, a need to get more dependable, reliable um, sources uh, of fuel close at hand. And, and this is one of the things I think contributes to the, the decline of the salt pans in the, uh, the Lake of Murray, is that the, um, the good fuel quality peat becomes remoter and remoter and remoter from the production points. So the opportunity cost of the labour outstrips the value that they're going to get back from it. And one of the things that's contributing to this is a major climatic shift uh, that takes place from the middle of the 13th century onwards. Um, we're, we're moving into um, the, the wolf minimum, um, minimum solar uh, sunspot activity. Things get colder, cooler, wetter, stormier. Um, and so uh, up here, it's this decline starting um, this, this is the medieval climate anomaly, and then a fairly nasty one in the late um, 14th century, and then down into, and down, and this is when things get really bad, Chris, in the, uh, the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And at the same time, moving in a different direction, this is coming down to modern here, North Atlantic storminess had been decreasing consistently, particularly across the last two and a half thousand years, and then suddenly, in the 13th century, bang, things start getting bad again. What does this mean? One of the things that peat doesn't do very well is burn when it's wet. Um, and they've got a major problem of getting a reliable supply of dry peat. And this is something that continues. You know, when I've looked at the records for, for Murray, uh, it, it becomes one of their particular fuel crisis problems. We cannot dry the peat. The peat has been destroyed, the peat is wet. Um, and they're too far away from the coal to make the coal worthwhile. But some of the abbeys, coincidentally, had begun to develop coal. They had uh, drift mines on a number of their uh, properties, Curus, Dunfermline uh, and Holyrood. And even St Andrews, up here on Drumcaro Craig, this is uh, looking down from Drumcaro towards St Andrews itself, various bell pits, um, are being um, dug in the late medieval period as the peat sources down round about Balgove are running out. Amongst the things, uh, this starts to go to a new direct seawater boiling pan site. Um, and one of the things that really pushes stuff forward is various um, supply crises elsewhere, the disruption of the Biscay salt trade during the Hundred Years' War, um, the, the Black Death's impact. That keeps some of these old pans going, but very quickly they want, want to move on to other sources. Um, and these other sources are not going to be so dependent on weather conditions, the worst of the wolf minimum and then the sporer minimum between 1460 and 1550. That um, these episodes coincide with the rapid growth of Scottish coal-fired direct seawater boiling salt production is probably no coincidence. And so just move through uh, back to the, the Murray situation. The problem with Murray is it's too far away from the big suppliers of coal. The um, Edinburgh-based merchants with their capital access in the 15th century 
are able to tie up deals and eventually take over salt production. They buy coal mines. They're also the people who are supplying the West Coast fish trade. And so this is the beginning of the monopolies um, of, um, well, trade dominance uh, by the, the Edinburgh elite um, at the late medieval, um, early modern period. And I think that's me. But the one thing I would say at the end, I was, uh, as, a, as, as a, a proud East Coaster, coming from the heart of civilization in Dundee, <laughs> to hear that Glasgow was already consuming more salt, clearly evidence from the late medieval period of the worst diet in Scotland, <laughs> is just <laughs> eternally gratifying. Thank you. Thank you.